All right. Hey, uh, for the sake of time, I want to make sure I got time to give you time to discuss. And I know this will always take. I may have overprepared, but uh, we're going to just jump in. This is very important. We're going to just. Uh, got three questions for you. You can. So on that little app, it'll say like there's a thing that says uh, Q and A, or it says polls. You want to click on the polls app. And I'm just going to ask three questions, and it's really just a poll today called, uh, which is better? And so we just want to hear from you. I gave you multiple choice, and you can kind of tell me what you think is better. Question number one is, which is the better beverage? Mm. I'm just giving you four. It's, it's not, it's just a question of four. Oh, amongst the four. All right, all right. Just want to get some opinions. There's nothing, you know, don't feel any over, uh, you know, won't be judged by the Lord for this. So, but Pepsi is definitely not the winning this battle. And honestly, honestly, I'm just shocked LaCroix has that many votes. But uh, that's okay, you know. I, I, I'm a firm believer that people who drink LaCroix have never actually drank anything else in their life. All right. Uh. All right. All right. Uh, right now, water's the clear winner. Coke and LaCroix there and poor Pepsi. You know, definitely not the choice of a new generation. Okay. Uh, next poll, these get a little harder. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this one to go here. Uh, which is the better happy place? We got, which is your better happy place? Disneyland, Universal. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, Universal Studios, or Bates Nut Farm. Let's see. I feel the debate. I feel like this is getting serious now, right? Down a little closer to home. All right. There you go. Got some love for Bates in there. All right. Some Disney, some knots. All right, all right. We're feeling, we're, ooh, oh. All right. Getting some good love. Some debate now, right? We're getting some stronger opinions on this. Okay. All right. One. So, knots is beating out Universal. I think it's the drive. All right. But Disneyland seems to be the clear winner. In by a slim, slim margin, it is the happiest place on earth. And then uh, just the last one today is just going to be uh, which is the better series? <laughs> Man, Little House on the Prairie's beating Star Wars. That Laura, that Laura Angles, man, could spin a yarn. I feel like we have a clear winner, the fellowship. There you go. All right. Poor Star Wars. Four billion dollars later, but that's all right. All right. All right. That's okay. It's not good. This is good. All right. I think we can all, I, I, I don't have, I, I do not uh, struggle. All right. Listen, if you haven't figured it out already, I just love to hear your opinion. It's always good to get some uh, opinion. My point is here is simple. This is this. We make judgments every day, don't we? We have opinions. We have thoughts. 
we can discern certain things, right? Observations and choices. We decide if something is good or bad, right? Or at least, in this case, better than something else, all right? Uh, you know, we use, what do we use? We use everything from our personal preference to our evidence-based facts. Every single one of us expresses opinions, uh, values, beliefs, and we do that through what? Through the process of judgment, right? Okay, and uh, we judge how we spend our time. We judge how we spend our money. We judge who we want to invest in and who we want to avoid, all right? And we judge what is morally and ethically right and wrong. And guess what? Dirty secret, there is no one who does not judge. And this is important because it's ironic and unrealistic when as Christians we go out into this world and what we believe about life and the world and about sin and salvation into the world and the world comes back with their favorite verse of all time, which is what? Do not judge. You know, judge not, right? Okay? Probably the most quoted verse in the Bible, of course, here is... Uh, is, uh, John, is Matthew 7, 1, you know, Matthew 7, 1, and, 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 and even if no one says the last half of it, it's used to what? It's used to, it's, I mean, this is like the social media verse, you know, judge not, bro. Uh, it's used to shut down any sort of pushback on a person's actions or their words, because the idea is that God, here in this verse, tells us not to judge. And when people judge, we're not being fair, we're not being kind, and people have become just gaslighted into believing that judging or holding a differing opinion or holding to an objective ethical standard, for that matter, is somehow unloving or wrong uh, that people are afraid to express uh, their opinion, right, on, on, or acknowledge demonstrable facts. This was on full display, right, last year when the nominee for the Supreme Court of the United States refused to define what a woman is. Remember that? Oh, I can't say. You can't say I mean, it's scary to think that people who cannot affirm observable reality are being confirmed as judges in the highest court of the land, right? You can't make a judgment on that? Okay, fine. But I think, listen, I think the real reason that people struggle with this verse and don't like this verse and refuse to judge is because, it's not because they're being shamed into not judging, but because somehow, intuitively, we all know the truth of what this verse is teaching here, that Jesus is teaching here. And of course, once again, Context, I love context, reveals the true meaning of the teaching. Look what he says here. Judge not that you be not judged. Okay? A lot of people stop there. That's not the, that's not the end of the verse. Verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye. Very visual. And I don't know if you've ever had, uh, you know, something like underneath your contact or something like that. You know what a speck can do. So imagine a log. All right. And then he says this, you hypocrite, first take out the log out of your own eye. And then, then, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right. So do we judge? Do we not judge? Let's, let's take a look. We're going to dive into this. And I, I wanted to we're gonna, there's going to be a lot of scripture today, so bear with me as we go through this, because I want us to understand what this verse is teaching and what our responsibility is as Christians when it comes to judging. So let's talk about the meaning of judgment. He says what? Judge not that you be not judged, because the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So we see this verse in context that we realize this is a warning, not a command. The only way to avoid judgment on yourself is to judge no one. And that's what people usually typically choose to do, right? Well, I don't want anybody to judge me, so I'm not going to judge anybody else, right? But if you do, the verse says, be prepared to expect the same level of treatment that you give to others. And this goes hand in hand, what would Jesus command? To what? To love our neighbors as ourselves, okay? This is not referring to legal judgment, but the moral internal judgment of people's character and value based on putting ourselves in the place of God. We're judging people. When he's talking about judgment, we're... We're talking about putting ourselves in the place of God to judge people. The message translation says this. Says, it says, don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment because that critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Isn't that true? It does, doesn't it? You know, and, and I think we can all be honest about that and we can know people who are judging. And guess what we do when we meet those people? <laughs> we do the same thing back to them. It's just... 
That's how we're wired, okay? And the warning is that if we judge inappropriately, then the same standard will be used for us. And of course, we're going to be judged by two people. We'll, we'll receive judgment from people, those, right? And those who cast stones are often the first to be hit by those stones. And we're going to be judged by God, all right? We can't think for a moment that people don't pay attention to how we treat other people. People are always watching other people and how they treat them. And we know that God... We know that God sees too. Galatians 6, 7 says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. So it's this principle of life, right? The golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. All right? And, you know, God says, whatever you plant, guess what? That's what you're going to harvest in your life. So you think it's true. Great. We shouldn't judge. That would be wrong. That would be mean. It would be rude and unloving. It just cause us trouble. But that's not entirely true, because guess what? The Bible tells us that as believers in Jesus Christ, that we are supposed to judge. God tells us what to judge, and God tells us who to judge. It's in the Bible, okay? I'm going to show you, all right? So real quick, let's talk about what we're supposed to judge and who we're supposed to judge. First of all, we're supposed to judge sound doctrine, okay? When I get up here and I preach and I tell you something, I sure hope you're reading along in your Bibles. And I hope you're checking me out and you're fact-checking me. I'm okay with that. You should be okay with that. All right? 1 Timothy uh, uh, 1, he tells Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. In other words, check what they're teaching, talk about it, and make sure they're not teaching the wrong things. Jude chapter 3 says, Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We're supposed to stand up and declare when something doesn't line up a truth. We have to be willing to say, well, that's not right. Okay? And when you hear a preacher preach something that is you don't think is right, you go to them later, you ask questions, and you talk to them, and if you find out that they're not teaching rightly, don't listen to them. Because look, there's, the internet's great, because you can hear anybody preach anything. I get my I have friends that send me reels all the time. What about this guy? I'm like, hey, you know, I'm like, that's not in the Bible. You know? So you just get, okay? Uh, one of my firefighters is a fantastic conspiracy theorist. I think he loves the Lord, but I think he's just like, oh, that, look at that, I told you, I knew it. I'm like, bro. It's not in the Bible. Just take a, take a breath. Take a deep breath. Whew, walk away. All right. So we're supposed to judge sound doctrines, which means, by the way, we need to know sound doctrine, which means we need to what? Read the Bible. Bible. Woohoo! Ding, ding, ding. Good job. All right. Because you can't spot a counterfeit unless you know what the real thing says. All right. Next, we're to judge sinful behavior. Really? Yes. He says in Leviticus 19.17, you shall not hate your fellow countrymen, in your heart, you may surely reprove your neighbor, he says. John MacArthur makes this point. He says, not to rebuke sin, listen to this, not to rebuke sin is a form of hatred, not love. Refusing to warn a person about his sin is just as unloving as refusing to warn him about a serious disease he may have. A person who does not warn a friend about his sin can't claim love as his motive. All right? When we see someone that we love sinning, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, we have a responsibility rooted in love to go to them and say, hey, that's not right. Because we know that sinful behavior brings discipline and judgment. And if we love them, we don't want them to go through that, right? It's okay. So we're supposed to judge sinful behavior. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into Matthew 18, but... Uh, we need to hear that. James 5.19, My brothers, if any of them among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Okay. So it's loving to call out sin. And to call out sin, you have to judge. Hey, that's wrong. And, and, and let's talk about who we're supposed to judge. Well, real quick, here's one. We're to judge ourselves. Oof. Ah, oh, the mirror. I hate it. The mirror never lies, right? How many of you avoid mirrors because you don't like it? We need to look in the mirror and hold our life up against the word of God and the life of Christ and ask, am I right with God? Am I right with God? And when I see shortcomings, I need to make changes. We need to make changes. 
Self-examination is important. That's what he writes in James. You know, if you look in the mirror and you see something and you walk away and forget what you look like, that's not good. But when we see those things, we need to make changes. We look in the mirror and we say, this has to change. And we choose to make those changes. David wrote in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That takes a lot of courage to say, God, look into my heart, show me what's wrong, help me to fix it. But you know what? That is the first step to seeing true and real change in your life. God, I need help. God, show me what's wrong so I can make this change in, in my life. Okay? So we need to judge ourselves. And that's not a bad thing. That just shows that you want to follow the Lord. Hiding it is worse. Running away from it is far, far worse. Because there's that old phrase, as you be sure your sin will find you out. Better let God to expose your sin like a good surgeon and make corrections than to, to than let it be exposed to the light at the most inopportune time. Okay. Here's another one. We're to judge our brethren, our brothers and sisters. Okay? You and I have a responsibility to hold one another accountable for how we live our life. And we see this here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy and the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Right? But now... I am writing to you not to associate, he says, with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or an idolater or a reviler, a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. And look what he says here. What have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Now, later when he, in, in Corinthians, he gives this whole list of sins. You know, these are the people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says this. He says, and such were some of you, all right? But you've been redeemed and cleaned by the word of God. I want you to understand, if you have sin in your past and God has forgiven you, that is in your past. But if you're living in that way and you're dwelling in that way, it is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to call it out, to judge that sinful behavior and amongst our brethren. See, there are things sometimes in the church that we tolerate because it's family, it's family. But we revile in those people outside the body of Christ. And this verse says that we have it backwards. It's amazing what we tolerate in the church, but we don't tolerate in unbelievers. When the verse is the exact opposite, the verse says, don't tolerate this among people who call themselves Christians. Don't worry about the people on the outside. I'll handle the people on the outside. And Paul says in verse 13, God judges those on the outside. Purge the evil person from among you. All right? Put them on the outside. I'll handle them. Is kind of what he's saying here. And so that verse teaches us, as much as we're to judge our brethren, that we are not to judge people outside the church. We're not to condemn them. We're not supposed to treat them the same way. We're supposed to... Remember, who, who was Jesus the hardest on? He was hardest on the religious people. But he had so much compassion for sinners. Why? Because they didn't have... They didn't know. They didn't know any better. Okay? And listen, why does he say this? Because we cannot expect... Listen. We cannot expect the unbeliever or the unredeemed to act like a born-again Christian. Don't expect, you know, someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit to walk around like a saint, right? We're so bent out of shape on people's behaviors, we forget that the problem is in their hearts. So no law, no protest, no vote, it's going to change people. And you can, you, look, we can legislate moral laws. I am all for moral laws, but guess what? You can't compel morality. You can't make people do the right thing. And if you force people to do the right thing and saying, well, this is what God wants, you know what they're going to do? They're going to push back. And if you don't believe me, go find a law you don't like. And then be like, well, I'm not going to buy that. You know, rah, 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 rah. Right? As soon as you, because come on, aren't we, let's be honest. As soon as you tell me I can't do something, what do you want to do? That thing. Way more than I did before. Right? Yeah, you can't tell me I can't have that? I'm going to buy 10 of them. So, when we try to make unbelievers live by God's law, guess what they're going to do? We're going to turn around and fight us every step of the way. And in some ways, the rebellion is so fierce that they will go to extremes just to make sure they can do whatever they want. Uh, Jesus says later, and I don't really have it here, but in verse 6, he says, don't throw your pearls before swine. He's saying, don't take the word of God and cast it to them because they'll trample on it and throw it back in your face. Okay? 
look, we don't expect foreign travelers to know all of our laws, right? Someone comes in here. Why do we assume people who don't share our king will live by his laws? And yes, anyone who chooses to live in our country, guess what? Yes, they should learn our laws. They should get driver's licenses. They should learn what stop signs mean. I'm a firm believer of that, okay? That might be a little personal. I apologize. But anyone who chooses to follow God will learn to live by his decrees. But until a person, until people know the law giver and they know his love and know his redemption, God's word is just rules ruining all of their fun. And here's something else we need to point out. And this is why this is important. When you look at the people to whom God gave his law, like in the Ten Commandments and all those things, it was the people he had saved. It was the people he had redeemed. He reminds them in, 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 in Deuteronomy, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. So after he does that, then he says, therefore, here's my Ten Commandments. He's not giving his rules to people and children that are not his. And so we can't expect people to live by God's law when they're not his kids. All right? You know, God is, 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 is harder on his people than everyone else, and that's because we're his children. And I think we wonder, I think we wonder, right, is God ever going to deal with the sins of the world? And guess what? Yeah, the Bible promises he will. Read Revelation. He's going to take care of it, all right? But we have to remember Peter's words. He says in 1 Peter 4, 17, it is time, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God. If we understand the judgment of God and we're like, when's God going to handle sinners? Oh, he's going to. That's what hell is for. But that should not compel us to go, well, they'll get theirs in the long run. No, that should cause us to, to mourn for them and have compassion on them and chase them down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? God's going to judge us. Sure. And if, he's gonna ju- and if he's judging us, what's he going to do to those outside the church? And if we fail to judge ourselves and our brethren, there's a danger that we'll become complacent, that we'll become accepting of sin in our lives and become complacent and accepting of sin in the church. Okay, so you know we're not supposed to judge people on the outside. Let's talk real quick what the Bible says, the things that we're not to judge, right? We said judge not. Okay, yes, there are things we're supposed to judge, and yes, there are things and ways we're not supposed to judge. The book of James talks about them really good. Here we go. Number one, uh, we are not to judge by appearance, Okay? Seems obvious, but somehow it's not. There are social experiments that demonstrate that attractive people often have advantages in life. All right? I remember when, when my kids were babies, they were these adorable babies. People would give my kids stuff. Oh, you're so cute. Here's an apple. Here's a whatever. I'm like, what? Where's this coming from? Right? It also broke my heart because I didn't get a lot of free stuff as a kid. That says... <laughs> All right. <laughs> James 2, 1 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing comes also in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and you say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, oh, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, right? You have not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Right? So we judge oftentimes by appearance. John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And what is the source of that right judgment? Well, it's God's word. We'll talk about that in a second. 1 Samuel 16, 7, remember Saul? He was tall and handsome. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. All right, so we're not to judge by appearance. We're also, we are not to judge people by affluence, right? Isn't it amazing in this world how it seems like people with money, you can like literally run over a person with your car, but if you have enough money, it's okay, okay? Listen, my beloved brethren, and that's a real thing that happened, by the way, in Cleveland, I remember it, football player ran over somebody, walked away, was playing next season. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Okay, so we don't judge people by affluence. And here's one other one, and this is a little different. We're not to judge people with false accusations. It says in James Four, don't speak evil against one another. The one who speaks evil uh, against 
against the law and judges the law. Um, The one who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, and you're not a doer of the law, but a judge, and there is only one lawgiver and judge, and he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? And the language he's using, it's kind of a strange verse, but the language he's using is saying not to slander people, not to make false accusations and falsely condemn people. It's a violation of that law to love your neighbor as yourself. Do not speak evil against one another because that is a judgment. You're, you're condemning a person using that judicial language. And here's another one, and this is one we're all guilty of because we love to jump to conclusions. We are not to judge people without all the facts. My... Uh, my <laughs> My ethics teacher in this class, I mean, he, he will give, here's a scenario. What do you guys think? He just give us a couple things. And he's like, now, here's the rest of the story. Now, what do you think? Like, I don't even answer because I know there's more information coming, right? Like, oh, let's just wait till the whole story comes out. Proverbs 18, 13, and 17. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is to his folly and shame. And he says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. You ever found that to be true? Someone tells you a story and you're like, oh, I can't believe they did that to you. That's the worst. Oh, my God. Rah, 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 rah. And then you find out that the person who came to you started it. And you're like, oh, come on. Wait a minute. Right? So we're not to judge without all the facts. And judgment can be a tricky thing, so it's important that we seek God's wisdom. And the main reason we're so underqualified to judge is that we don't have the wisdom and knowledge of God. And when you look at the things that we are to judge, Look at this. We realize that the things that God tells you that we're to judge are all rooted in the revealed word of God. So God gives us, this is so important, God gives us his guidance and standards in the Bible so we can rightly judge when it's appropriate. The judgment we're supposed to do is supposed to be based on God's word, not on arbitrary things like appearance or affluence. What does God's word say? And it's so important that we get our understanding of judgment correct because it directly impacts how we are personally affected by judgment, which is what the next reverse reveals. I know I'm going to go through these real quick. So if we, that was all talking about the meaning of judgment. Let's talk about the measure of judgment really quick, right? For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, right? So how you treat others is what you should expect to receive. And it's funny how people who can dish it out usually can't take it. If you know these people, people who are critical and harsh are usually shocked when they're the recipients of criticism. And people rarely have anything bad to say about someone who doesn't speak poorly of others. There's a story about a man. He had signed up for a cruise, and he was trying to save money because, you know, all those double occupancy rules on on cruises. Well, he's going by himself. So to save money, he had agreed to share a double room with another passenger who he never actually met. So he goes, he checks out his room, he meets his bunkmate, and the man later, he goes to the ship's concierge and asks him, would it be all right uh, if I leave my wallet, my passport, and a few other valuables in the ship's safe? He says, he says look, it's not something I would normally do, but uh, you know, after meeting the man who was sharing his berth, judging by his appearance, he was concerned that his roommate might not be a, uh, a trustworthy person. To which the purser took the valuables, put it in the safe, and said, that's all right, sir. I'll be very glad to take care of your things. In fact, uh, your roommate was just up here and left his valuables for exactly the same reason. That's what happens. It boomerangs. comes back to us. It's the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And one more thought. Just like judgment, the Bible says the measure of grace you extend will be the measure you receive. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay. And in fact, if we don't treat people this way, then you know what we do? We make a mockery of judgment. Look what he says. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? So when I was a kid teenager, my dad liked to go to the casino, and he would go out to, I think, Viejas and hang out with his friends and stay out all night, and sometimes my dad would come home with breakfast before I'd head out to school, okay? I'm getting ready to school, and here comes dad with a bag of food. So as I got older, well, guess what I did? I stayed out later and later. In fact, fun fact, I didn't get a curfew until I was 17 and a half, okay? 17 and a half. 
uh, because I, one night I was at a friend's house, I fell asleep, and I just ended up staying there all night. And my folks didn't know. And you know when they found out? When my dad came home at 6 a.m. and I wasn't there. Now he guessed where I was and I called and I hear, I hear the phone ring. I wake up to the phone ring and I'm like, uh-oh. You know, and I hear my friends, yeah, yeah, he's here. Okay, you need to go home. Okay, right? So, you know, I'm getting there. And my dad's like, listen, you've got a curfew. And I'll be honest with you. I, at that point, being a 17-year-old teenage boy, I wanted to throw my dad's habits back in his own face. Like, oh, yeah? Fortunately, my mom did it for me, right? Mama, you know, she's like, Joe, how can you expect him to come home when you're never home? It was a moment. It was a moment. And I think my dad learned a lesson there. It was like, <laughs> okay. Right? It was kind of hard to tell me I should be home when he was out till dawn like every, you know, like every night. Okay. But there's two words that we need to remember, two words we need to learn from this. And here's what I want you to pick up. First one is legalism. Right? And legalism happens when we're so worried about everyone else's spirituality that we ignore our own. Do as I say, not as I do. And guess what that leads to? Legalism leads to our second word, hypocrisy. And hypocrisy happens when we don't think we play by the same rules everyone else needs to. It's the log in our eye when they have a speck in yours. Jesus was talking about the Pharisees. He said, for they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. You know, it's not our place to play God when we're not even dealing with our own issues. And chances are, no one would listen to us anyway. But here's the thing. There is a method of judgment. It says, you hypocrite, look at it, he says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So it's only after we've judged ourselves that we have any right or perspective to judge others. And if we're honest enough to deal with and admit our own shortcomings and deal with it, then when we're approaching others, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do it with compassion instead of condemnation. We're going to be able to come to people because we understand what they're going through. We understand where they've been. And we know what it leads to. We know the consequences of sin that isn't dealt with, and we want to protect people from that. We have a lot more compassion for people when we realize that we are or were in the same boat they are. Paul wrote again to Timothy, his son in the faith, I thank God who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formally... Here's his log. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And the saying is trustworthy and, and, and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Some translations said, of whom I'm the chief. He still considers himself the worst sinner. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the chief of sinners, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul could preach grace and truth and be taken seriously because he had experienced grace in his own sin and he made those changes. Okay? He could see clearly. He got the log and the, removed from the, the scales taken off of his eyes. And look, it's hard to point fingers at someone who has already dealt with their own sin. And when we've humbly dealt with our own sin, we can humbly encourage and admonish, and dare I say it, judge others rightly according to God's word. All right, well, so what? That's a lot. Whew. It's a lot to take in, guys. I get it. It's a hard verse. Well, we've got to learn to deal with it, okay? Because it's in the Bible. But I want to be clear that God isn't telling us not to judge. He's telling us to judge rightly with humility and with integrity to judge ourselves and deal with our sin, to judge other, our brothers and sisters in Christ so that the body of Christ might be presented spotless before the Lord, okay? You and I, guess what? We make judgments every day, don't we? Every day. Every day. Fortunately, we have been given the word of God to guide us to right living. And God has made the rules and we have a responsibility to each other to keep the rules for ourselves and admonish other believers to do the same. God will handle people on the outside. Our job is to recognize they are sinners in need of God's grace and to tell them about it. And let's remember this, that for believers, judgment is for correction and discipline. I want you to hear that. When, when, when we judge one another, it's to help us be put on the right path. And discipline is for correction that we might walk with God. 
For unbelievers, God's judgment will be for condemnation. There's a big difference between discipline and correction and condemnation. I discipline my kids so they'll learn right from wrong. Condemnation is, would be putting them in, them in jail. That's why God says leave it to him. And the best thing we can do is tell people about Jesus so they'd avoid the final judgment. So listen, don't ever let anybody tell you it's not loving to judge. Okay? We must do so with wisdom and grace. Make sure that we're not guilty of the very things we condemn others for. And our judgments must be rooted. Listen, our judgment must be rooted in compassion, not condemnation. When in doubt, look in the mirror. How do you want to be judged? Harshly or truthfully and kindly? And once you answer that question, you're going to know how God wants you to approach judging others. Amen? All right. Lord, thank you for this time in the Word. Challenge.